Welcome in this first international edition of VAK Vision. Following the success of last year's French edition, this renewed online exclusive program aims at giving more vision and ambition to artificial intelligence in service of sustainable business transformation. Through Academia's insight and business cases, we'll question how data science and artificial intelligence can accelerate transformations. I'm very glad to meet you, Jean-Baptiste Bouzige. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, you co-founded Echometrics in 2006 and has been promoting sustainable, ethical and explainable AI sense. Thank you, Laura. Echometrics is a pioneering leader of AI solutions for sustainable business performance. And since 2006, uh, and across the globe, thanks to our four offices, we are creating AI solutions that are scalable and that are combining high impact results with purpose-led, sustainability-led strategies. Impressive. And this event, the Equivision? Is dedicated to our clients uh, to give them a, a vision of the future of AI because AI is never uh, an end in itself. And so we need to put in perspective the best use of AI, the best practices to face and to answer the most difficult questions and challenges of our times. We will go through presentations, interviews on two roundtables to address directly the most burning question for brands. What does the road towards a sustainable business performance look like? Yes, actually, uh, it starts and the first step is uh, about uh, making a business case for sustainability because we often oppose sustainability and short-term or financial goals while actually strategy is about combining both, being able to capture both worlds in one strategy to build the competitive advantages of tomorrow and also of today. So the best of both worlds. And that's what shows in the programme the first round table gathers Isabelle Bajeu, Dean of Taper Business School at Carnegie Mellon University, and Asmita Dubey, Chief Digital and Marketing Officer at L'Oréal Group, what has been done already in terms of data transformation. After that, I must say I was quite surprised you would invite Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize of Economy, to speak of sustainable artificial intelligence. Is most renowned for his researches on cognitive biases. For sure, and it's even more, it's one of the most important things. And, and because transformation is about making bold choices, while often status quo is more comfortable. Um, and, and, and after that, we will try in the second round table with Nicolas May, uh, co-founder of the Future Society, and Philippe Rambach, uh, chief AI officer at Schneider Electric, uh, to really give concrete advice, concrete best practices about how to use AI at the service of sustainable business transformation. And this word, sustainable business transformation, what does it mean for Equimetrics? Actually, um, the definition is really about building this bridge between two worlds that are not connected enough or often opposed. On, on the one end, you have the world of sustainability, uh, uh, and the best way to capture it has been done by uh, the economist uh, Kate Hayworth with the donut theory, uh, meaning that you have to operate your business above uh, social ground and below the planet boundaries. And on the other hand, you have the world of business, the way, business, the way we operate it today with financial goals, with performance, etc. And actually, while it's obvious for everyone that reaching and crossing the planet boundaries will change uh, dramatically and forever the way we operate business, we see a strong disconnect between the bus, to bus topics in, in the companies. So today, it's really important to, to see how you can bridge that, how you can build a strategy combining both, because it's not just about planet boundaries or saving the planet. It's, it's a really concrete, short-term question on business models. Why? Because you have new forces that are shaping the economy, shaping the competitive advantage. We are talking about regulation. We are talking about the exposure to climate or geopolitical events, and especially the impact on cost. We see that with the energy. We are talking about the changes in customer behavior. 
And in times of big change, that's a moment where you can have a disruption of a market and new competitors that are native with the new behaviors and that can dramatically change the market. And finally, we have the pressure of employees because we see that the companies that are struggling to find a sustainable long-term purpose are the ones that are struggling actually to hire and to retain people. That bridge, that way of really understanding and mastering these tensions, these disruptions, it's sustainable business performance. And that's where you see that it's not about what AI can do, showing the promises of uh, innovation. It's about what AI should do to accelerate and enable this transformation. Let's dive into it with our first round table. We'd like to think that sustainability should be a granted objective, but we're conscious it is a difficult journey. Across industries, companies are now turning to data science and artificial intelligence. In theory, these new technologies should give competitive advantage and help companies in their business transformations. So many questions to discuss with you. Isabelle Bajeux, Dean of Taper Business School at Carnegie Mellon University. Cotin Michard, co-founder of Equimetrics. And Asmita Dubey, Chief Digital and Marketing Officer at L'Oréal Group. Isabelle Bajeux, what can we learn from the history of data transformation? Why is it so difficult? Thank you for the question. I'm, first of all, I'm delighted to be here and uh, talking about these important points today. Um, I would say the first thing is that uh, at Tepper, at Carnegie Mellon University, we, invent, we invented management science. Uh, we've been always looking at um, the way to solve business problems mm -hmm. by using data instead of using uh, past cases that may or may not be relevant, depending on the cases. The reality is that there's no blueprint for a pandemic, for example. And uh, it's only with um, a very different approach, which is very data-oriented, that uh, we can come up with solutions that make sense for the, the industry. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, business schools, universities in general, are incredibly important, obviously, for uh, companies in the way that we're producing the talents that... Uh, will then work within the companies and advancing these companies. Um, one of the things we don't want to be is to be in an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. We really want the collaboration with the industry and uh, really at different levels. So it is both for undergraduate students, master's students, PhD students, and uh, professors. So at all levels, we want the industry to be our partners in the way that we do research, in the way that we're teaching our students. Uh, and that's incredibly important in what we're doing. And, uh, and I think this is something that is really powerful. The, the third thing I would say is that I really have a pet peeve. And uh, that's when people talk about data-driven. I don't like the idea of data driving anything, uh, but I, I like the idea of being informed with the data. So the branding that we came up with, well, first of all, we call it the intelligent future. And when we're thinking about intelligence, nice French word, uh, it is about the balance between artificial and human intelligence. And the tagline that we're using is that we want to be data-informed and human-driven. And obviously that applies, you know, within a business school context, but it applies, I think, for a lot of companies. In particular, I would say, when we're talking about issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, with uh, what we know as be, being very deep, algorithm biases. Uh, if we're driven by the data, if we're driven by our algorithm, we're going to just reproduce 
uh, whatever is the status quo right now, and that's not where we want to be. We really want uh, a better society, and we really want uh, you know, our students and the future business leaders to work for a better society. Uh, Cotin Michard, with your experience working with Fortune 500 companies embarked in data transformations for 15 years, what are the main obstacles that they met? There are four main challenges for, for, for companies willing to engage and transform their company with AI. I guess the first is around uh, those companies piling up use cases without real strategy about, uh, about what they want to achieve. And I guess uh, the challenge for them is to have the, the right level of sponsorship within the companies. And I guess L'Oréal and Asmita here is a very good example of the way the CEOs and CMOs and the executive committee embark the whole company into this transformational journey. It's very, a very strong prerequisite for success. The second, Isabel just told about it. It's a question of the challenge they have is to, uh, is, uh, is, you know, it's very difficult to disrupt yourself alone. So you need people to help you to do so. And I guess there is a question for them to, to find the right partners. And let's be honest, the market is fairly immature there. So you have the uni that have this uh, role to provide uh, new talents with new skill sets to help the, those companies transform. You have like small entities, startups, small ecosystems, very disruptive, that can help those big companies to innovate. But then the question is how you can scale those initiatives being small. And also, you have those big business services, traditional business services, uh, big companies. But beyond the claim of being agile and being uh, uh, innovative and being business partners, we, they all recognize it's very hard for them to deliver on that promise. So the maturity of the ecosystem is a challenge. Third, I guess it's a question of how you want to make it, this happen. Um, there's this question always for those companies between the make or buy. Should I make the AI, AI asset? Should I produce that myself and embark into in-house capabilities? Or should I rent or um, yeah, rely on external partners to do so? So there is no, uh, looking on the last decade, there is no winning model, clear winning path for that. So there's winning and, and failure in both models. I guess it's very important for the, for the company willing to embark there to be very uh, sharp and very um, focused on, on deciding what is the right path for each use cases and very instruct that carefully. Um, last but not least, um, I think uh, it's a question of, in the end of the day, uh, being very transformative. I think the companies have realized how much it's, uh, it takes to transform uh, a, a, a company with AI and digital assets. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a tech journey, it's a transformational journey. You have technology, but you need to embark people and transform your people. You need to embark business processes to, to ensure business adoptions of your assets and solutions. Mm -hmm. So it's a world journey. And I guess the last decade has learned those companies to maybe uh, being more clear about the size of the scale of this transformation and the effort it, uh, it implies to do so. Asmita Dubey, you wanted to react? Has L'Oréal experienced such difficulties? Yeah, no, it's a very, very interesting perspective that you bring. I, I think I will start with digitalization and then move to the data transformation. We have been digitalizing for more than a decade now. You know, and you brought about the challenges, I'll talk about them. Our then CEO, Mr. Jean-Paul Lagong, he, he declared in 2010, that this is the year of digital. And from there triggered this goal to be digital first. Today we are moving to data first, yeah. So in this journey, and you were talking about transformation, but in the digital transformation journey, we went through many things. I mean, the first thing is to digitalize the beauty consumer journey with the new touch points, adapted content, to pivot to new business models like e-commerce you know, acceleration, uh, to create factories of scale, whether it is websites or content, and they allow us to operate at one base and to collect data also in one stage. We are also talking a lot about talent and upskilling, you know, so to bring in new talent, because there is talent in the company, but there are some parts which are not there, and to the rest of the company to upskill 
no matter it's digital or data transformation today. So to give you an example, we have 5,500 people who are the digital community. A lot of them have been brought in and almost 67,000 people have been upskilled over this period. And the fifth point in terms of overall transformation that we go through is this idea of measuring, tracking, knowing what is the goal. And it is true that the the transformation is moving from digital transformation to data transformation. So first we have to transform everything into data to transform via data. And that, all of those are like challenges. I think all five, but especially on data, there is a lot of challenges. Two or three challenges that I would say. The first one is to approach it as a test and learn. Because uh, on each aspects of this transformation, if I were to say, uh, it's not like we got it right the first time. When we started doing content management systems, we had to do it many times over. Today, we are looking at data domains. And as we test it, we realize that what part of the data is there, what is not there. The second thing to do is to seize what is starting. You know, and we have all, L'Oreal has always been about seize what is starting. Uh, and, uh, and, and the third thing to do is, again, um, with all these subjects, uh, so many functions, so many people, so many different parts are connected that at an organization, there has to be a level of simplicity with which we operate. Uh, because all these are challenges for the organization and you learn, we learn as we go along it. Katan Michel, you accompany L'Oréal and other companies in these transformations. Uh, according to you, what are the key success factors for sustainable business transformations? Yeah, it's uh, just to, to pursue what Asmita was saying. I think there is a motto from digital transformation that is very well spread out now, uh, which is the think big, test small, learn fast. Though I think this uh, this motto need to be a bit revised when it comes to the sustainable transformation because the stakes are different. Mm -hmm. um, for when it comes to climate change, uh, we need all the companies need to start from the end state. I mean, they all need to reach carbon neutrality. They all need to operate within the planet boundaries in a few decades. Uh, that's the end point. And so it's not really about being competitive because digital is about providing new product, new services to your clients, so you get a winning uh, competitive advantage there. Here, we all need to finish and to be there at the finish line altogether. So it's a bit different. Uh, and I would say, uh, as well, for CEOs, and they know that, I mean, business as usual is, is more and more complex. Growth for growth is more and more complex. So they need to future-proof their business model. And for that, they need to transform as well. So I would rephrase the think big, test small into the think long, mm -hmm. because they need now to envisage something a bit different and wider than just the growth for growth. They need to test wise. Um, there is a lot about uh, the tech pledge and innovation pledge. Now companies need to innovate, being careful about the impact of their innovation within the ecosystem. So they really need to test wise the initiatives. And then it's about learning, but it's also about sharing your knowledge. Uh, learning for yourself is not enough. If we want to deliver the sustainability change we need to deliver for the planet, it's about sharing your initiatives. So think uh, long, test wise, and share. And please don't fail. <laughs> There's few space for failure uh, for, the, for the sake of our old children. Yeah. The second stake they have uh, for the CEOs, uh, it's, it's uh, reported by Forrester. I mean, Climate change is in the agenda of 60% of the CEO and top, top of, the, of the agenda. So it's very important for them. And I think the challenge is really to embark. It's transformational as well. So you need to embark all your ecosystem with you. Not only your employees, but you need to embark your employees. You need to embark your customers. You need to embark your suppliers and providers, all the value chain in, within uh, where you operate. And last but not least, they need to embark their shareholders. Mm. And we know the path is fairly narrow there, so there's really a, at stake for the CEOs this question of remodel their corporate leadership. Recently in Financial Times, uh, you can read that you know, uh, US institutions are pulling out money from BlackRock, which is the, I mean, the worldwide the world leader in asset management. Mm. Uh, and the reason why they're pulling out the money is that 
they um, argue that BlackRock is too much into sustainability and not supporting enough oil and gas. So you see that you know, there's some key challenge and we are in an area where you want to be very careful but also very bold into your, your corporate leadership. And I think even though the path is narrowed, it's also probably the unique opportunity for the CEOs of those times to, share, to demonstrate what true leadership is. Isabelle Bajeux, what do you think is the role of academics and talents to guide it? Well, this is an incredibly important role, obviously. Uh, as I said earlier, we're feeding uh, the corporate world with talents. Um, one piece that uh, Amista discussed early, earlier is, uh, to me, incredibly important is the fact that Uh, students are coming to universities, but now we have the deep understanding that whatever they're going to learn is not going to be enough for all of their career. So there will be needs for reskilling. Uh, there will always be these needs, and right now we see a lot of needs uh, in terms of AI education in general. Asmita Dubey, how do you lead this upscaling, rescaling, both in data science and in soft skills in L'Oréal? Yeah, no, we, we uh, I mean, we, we are bouncing off each other, but like you said, it is so important to, to keep on doing that. So our new philosophy is upskill, reskill, and new skills. You know, so at one time you're upskilling, on your subject. So let's say the subject is AI or data analytics or data science, and then you reskill. So you reskill them to pivot them to something else. So if they start getting into CRM or consumer relationships, it is a reskilling, but a bit related. And then completely new skills. So somebody who has to code or AI is a completely new skill. So how can we take the 5,500 people and the ones who are the broader you know, marketing and uh, community, how do we upskill, reskill, and new skill, gather new skills for them so that we are all the time uh, you know, uh, serving what, what is coming? So Cotton Michel has a conclusion to what, um, how we can lead a sustainable data transformations, what would you say? I guess in very few words, it's just to rebound on Isabelle, it's uh, the winners will be the ones that are able to combine the AI and the science with the heart of sustainability. So it's a question of translation. Yes, absolutely. I, I think what I'm trying to do every day is to break silos. Mm. So breaking silos, it's uh, incredibly important because There's no solution that is going to come from one discipline, and there is no solution that is not going to come from a deep collaboration with the industry. And, uh, and the second thing is uh, within disciplines, uh, within the university. So we have a chance to be within a university that has uh, incredible you know, research that is being done in artificial intelligence, in computer science in general, in engineering. In, uh, in, in lots of amazing topics. And uh, we want to leverage that as the business school to make sure that the solutions that are brought to the world are really interdisciplinary because these are the only solutions that are going to work. Now for us, uh, I think I would say that we are, we are pioneering beauty tech. You know, we are pioneering beauty tech and beauty tech to us means uh, a new kind of relationship with our consumers. The future of beauty will be powered by technology. You know, technology is helping us to bring more personalization, like we spoke about it. It is also helping us in terms of formulating new products that are more effective. And we also use technology for, uh, for being more sustainable for our L'Oreal for the future goals. And to give you an example here, for our professional products division, we are partnering with a company on a device called Gyoza. And gyoza is used in the salons by hairstylists and it helps to save water. It's a shower head with a technology that saves water while coloration and washing hair. So technology helps in different aspects of our business today. The issue comes from the contradiction between the economic drive towards long-term vision and the psychological barriers keeping us running after short-lived benefits. There is one researcher 
who is known for exploring these fields at the border of economics and psychology. He studied human behavior, the way we take decisions and the way we make mistakes. Daniel Kahneman received the Nobel Prize of Economy on countless distinctions for his contribution to the knowledge of decision-making in uncertain contexts. His most recent book, Noise, subtitled A Flow in Human Judgment, explores why two leaders in the same situation, with the same information, might take different decisions. Jean-Baptiste Bouzige interviewed Daniel Kahneman to understand why when the need to change is so obvious, why don't we change? Can we? Hi everyone, I'm really delighted today to welcome Daniel Kahneman, the 2002 Nobel Prize of Economy. Hi Daniel. My pleasure to be here. And we, today we're going to have a, a conversation about change, AI, decision making, noise, many interesting topics to share. Daniel, when we see the contrast between IPCC reports and everything around climate change and the general status quo, uh, we ask ourselves, why is it so hard to change when change or the need for change is so obvious? It's obvious without being urgent. And urgency is really the, what we lack. And, when we think about climate change. And do you, you, you describe it as a kind of a, a perfect problem for decision making? Why is it? A well, it's a perfect problem in the sense that it's the problem that people are really, it's the kind of problem that people are very poorly equipped to deal with. Uh, it's abstract, it's long term, it's invisible, it's contested. So there's no complete agreement. So there is uncertainty about every aspect of it. And so something that is remote and uncertain has no urgency. And, and it's extremely difficult to mobilize people when there is no urgency. And my, my example is actually that it, people mobilize for war. So when there is a war, uh, it's relatively easy. Everybody understands that it's an emergency, that the normal rules do not apply, that everybody must contribute. Uh, but somehow we do not see climate change as a war, although it could be more dangerous than any war that we've had. And, and, and when we see that on the side of companies, um, would you say that there is uh, the right set of incentives for company to change? In a way, clearly not. That is, uh, to the extent that mobilization for climate change is costly and would impose costs for companies, then the incentives are not present. Certainly in the United States, uh, there is a legal obligation for the company to maximize profit. And in the short term, there is a lot of pressure to maximize share price. So that, that creates a concern with the short term, especially in the American context. I think, I think it could be different in the European context. So uh, the, the incentives for participating in climate change uh, you know, there's some ideological ideal, you know, some people really do this because they believe in it. In addition, uh, it, it is now part of the brand of, of organizations to at least pretend that they are doing something for, for climate change. And that boundary between pretense and reality is, is where everything is going to happen. Yeah, and, and something that is surprising in companies that that dis you describe that focus on on short term, finally shareholder uh, incentive, but also even for them too, it's a question of education and being aware of the this challenge, etc. And you mentioned you highlight well in your last book, Noise, the fact that CEO's intuition finally is a perfect illustration of how bad human judgment is. 
Well, uh, maybe not a bad. No, but, uh, I, I oh. think <laughs> I think that would be going a little too far. But one thing that is true is that uh, you don't get to be a CEO unless you have a lot of confidence in your judgment. And if you have a lot of confidence, chances are that to some extent you're overconfident. And so people get selected for a high level of confidence in their intuition. And that's what you get a lot when you interact with uh, CEOs. You get ultimately, uh, they have to feel right about what they're doing. And feeling right about what you're doing, uh, has, it has to conform to their intuition. Uh, otherwise, they don't, they don't feel what they need to feel to take action. And, and, and you have shown with several experiments that human judgment is quite systematically overperformed even by simple models, not even AI. Yes, I mean, that's, I haven't had to show it. This has been known for about 70 years. Uh, that when you compare in, when you compare forecasts made by humans to forecasts made by a statistical aggregation, even very simple rules, even taking the one or two best cues and combining them uh, optimally or even not optimally, uh, most of the time models do better than people. And when they don't do better, they do, they do just as well. And the reason is interesting. The reason is important is that models and algorithms are noise-free. Humans are, are noisy. And that's the key difference. There is now, when you're comparing humans to, to AI and even to highly complex regression, then then certainly AI is capable of weighting data better than people so that ultimately there is really more accuracy. It's not only noise, but uh, any system that eliminates noise uh, is very likely to be able to be better than, than human judgment. And that's well known. And, um, but even sometimes simple forecasting models, you have this, this reaction often that says, okay, it's a good model, but it doesn't take into account that small portion of the thing, etc. That's the kind of resistance we see every day to, to say, okay, it's... There, there is really a finding that's, that's very consistent and extremely difficult to, uh, to accept. And this is who should have the last word, because there is a lot of research on that. Um, and it turns out on the role of humans and, you know, rules, algorithms. And typically we think that humans should have the last word. But actually, when humans have the last word, you get a lot of noise because humans are really noisy. Uh, so actually the best use of humans is as inputs to a model. They provide inputs and their judgments provide inputs that the model can use. But the final word in principle, unless there is what we call broken leg cases, which are obvious cases that clearly the model is not applicable. But where the model is applicable, where you don't have an obvious reason to overrule it, the model should have the last word. And this is very difficult for people to accept. And do you think that here yeah, we have a probably a question about the accept acceptability of, of models. So we have talked uh, about interpretability, uh, explainability, but in a way explainability, so there are many ethical reasons for that, but you would say that it's a way to make the CEO or the decider okay with l letting the last word to the model? Uh, certainly not for CEO. CEOs may decide that the model will have the last word for people below them in the hierarchy, but it's very difficult for me to imagine a CEO saying, well, you know, I have my intuitions, but the model says otherwise because we expect CEOs to make decisions. That's their function, that's their role. And they're delegating it to, to a model. Um, I think that's 
that's not likely to happen very quickly. Or at least to take it into account, what is the level of storytelling needed? Well, I mean, that's, this is pretty clear that uh, what convinces people and what is what allows people to change their intuitions or what governs their intuitions are stories. They're not numbers and they're not outputs of models. Uh, stories have a lot of power. And unless people are extremely sophisticated and have had a lot of statistics and, and are numerate in a deep way, uh, then stories are absolutely essential. What is funny is that when we, when we talk about your books with colleagues, with other people, etc., everyone is, uh, as basically says that they have learned a lot about our practice as data scientists, etc. But actually, it's really also difficult to change. And, uh, and you were describing me uh, uh, a seminar in the Napa Valley where with CEOs where everyone was really interested, but in the end, what happens? Well, yes, we had. It was a, a master class with the uh, CEOs of important companies. It was 15 years ago. Um, but they were already important companies then. They're more important now. And everybody seemed to like the seminar. And, but in the last session, uh, I raised the question of what can this do for you? And really, everyone found a reason why it wasn't applicable to them. And so I'm not optimistic about people just taking, taking advice. They can be very interested. They can feel they have learned something. And where I would be more optimistic in principle is for people applying it to the decisions of underlings, not, not for themselves. So if one managed to create, to convince CEOs that the decisions that are made not by them, but below them, uh, should be designed, that procedures should be designed to optimize decision-making, that may be possible. There is a chance of doing that. I think the likelihood of convincing CEOs that to change the way they think, I'm not very optimistic about that. And in that, in that perspective, you, the, you use the energy of a factory for decision-making. Yes, I mean, I think, I think it's useful to think of organizations as factories that produce decisions. And once you take that image, a factory, there is a process that you want to control the process. And there has to be some rules or some uniformity to the process. And then there is quality control. And having those thoughts of what is the optimal process and what is the quality that we demand of decisions, how we should evaluate decisions, not by their results, but by the way they were made. Uh, they, they would change procedures. Here there is a big difference between individuals and organizations. Individuals are unlikely to learn to, to think differently, but organizations have procedures, they have rules, and, and to design procedures to be optimal that is not uh, out of the question for organization. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. If we, if we think, um, if we look back to the initial question about why is it so difficult to change, when change is obvious, even if obvious is misleading <laughs> by itself, but in organization with this idea of implementing AI, what would be your, your first advice in that idea of introducing the AI in that factory? Well, I mean, I think it's, there is a general rule uh, when you are trying to introduce change. And this is that any change, there are winners and there are losers. There are people who benefit and there are people who lose. And, and the, as a general rule, the losers fight harder, harder than the winners. So, uh, and, and a lot of what blocks change is taking care of the people who are going to lose from it and, and making sure that they don't lose too much and that they can accept the change. And focusing on potential losers is, I think, very important. This, by the way, is the reason why reforms of many kinds 
either fail or are much more expensive than, than predicted. And this is because you have to compensate the losers. People that are perceiving themselves as yeah. losers, meaning yeah. that we need to but also You need to take care of that. Yeah. You need to accept that and you need to take care of that. And that's, that's not easy. Thank you, Daniel Kahneman. My pleasure. I hope that people will be optimistic about the AI change uh, with that conversation. Thank you. To wrap up Daniel Kahneman's view, a safe judgment in an uncertain context is the fruit of a balance between defiance of one's own biases and trust in one's own abilities. The most uncertain of contexts is the future. When I'm teaching, I often wonder what will my students do with what we're saying on artificial intelligence? Because they are the ones who will be facing the future. So we decided to ask them some questions. What does a data-driven company look like in 10 years? The most important thing about now is really to focus on sustainability and to use all the resources we have to try and achieve that for companies. And data is a very powerful tool for that. Machine learning technologies are going to be widely more spread. And uh, I think the data as a whole <coughs> in the world is going to be much uh, more available, uh, cleaner uh, and easier to use. So. The idea of data in 10 years will not simply be whether a company should have data, is how well a data um, will be incorporated. So the companies that utilize data in a very ethical and um, humanitarian way will be the companies that will lead the entire industry. Um, and what does the sustainable company of 2035 looks like? The company that doesn't um, have any activities in uh, polluting industries highly data-driven and AI-driven, um, doing good for the society, but also at the same time maintaining its own brand image using data. It's a company that seeks for the long term rather than the short term. So really data he needs to be incorporated in all of the companies in 10 years. It's a company that also looks, looks after its uh, carbon output uh, internally as well as externally in its investments and its, uh, and its uh, projects. And as a consumer, uh, as a buyer, do you mind for sustainability? Is it something important to you? Sustainability matters even more now and we have to make an impact. So when choosing a product, buying a product or working for a specific company, sustainability is within the top three priorities for me. It definitely affects my purchase decision. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, um, I'm a consumer, but first of all, I'm a student and I don't have like tons of money. I would yeah, opt for that project, of course, but uh, for me right now, price is the number one concern, for sure. Um, how does a company become sustainable, to your mind? How uh, How is it going to keep our society, our world, uh, like how to maintain the balance and how to keep it uh, uh, safe and bring positive impact? Uh, everything has the yin and yang, have the good and bad, and it's just how to maintain the right balance and the, the right usage on the right things with the right procedure. The company becomes sustainable when it stops thinking about economic profit only, but also by looking at the impact it can have on society. Let's see what Equimetrics guests with their corporate experience think of it. It is a question of what society we want in the future and which future for society. Who can better address this question than Nicolas Miei, uh, who is the founder of the Future Society. In discussion with Laurent Félix, Head of Sustainable Business Transformations and General Manager of France at Equimetrics, and Philippe Ramba, Chief AI Officer at Schneider Electric. Nicolas Miei, you founded the Future Society to anticipate and risks and opportunities of artificial intelligence. What did the students inside inspire to you? Well, really resonated with me. Uh, 
you know, showing that the work that we've been doing, including at the Global Partnership on AI, to build the field of responsible AI adoption for the environment, building operational frameworks, building metrics, and including educational and capacity building um, solutions is not in vain. They are really demanding solutions, they are demanding pathways, and they are demanding opportunities. And if you listen carefully to what they say, they are also something, something which is very important, which is that they are demanding meaningful jobs. They don't want to work anymore for organizations that simply maximize the shareholder value. They want the value to help solve and move towards net neutrality. And the last thing that it, you know, it projected me towards is the fact that they see the value of digital technologies, and particularly AI, in solving the climate crisis. And, and I think it's great because, indeed, when you look at what AI is about, which is predominantly about distilling raw data into information, optimizing complex systems, improving prediction, and catalyzing new scientific discovery, we clearly have in front of us a great opportunity. If and only if we don't fall into the trap, the dangerous trap of techno-solutionism. And let me be very clear from the get-go. AI can be a solution, but only will play a, a, a small part of the solution, vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, behavioral adaptation. And it's something which is very important to understand, because if we, fee, if we fall into the trap of technological solutionism, we run the risk of amplifying what we have seen in season one of AI with racial bias, amplified fake news, environmental impact, and the potential implosion of our democratic models. And what we have tried to demonstrate with the report we commissioned last year at GPA on AI for climate action is that there are countless use cases uh, to help advance climate action through AI across a number of industrial fields. Electricity, as Philip will talk about later, buildings and cities, heavy industries and manufacturing, agriculture, market and finance, land use, forestry. So the potential is there. It's there for us to capture only if we don't trip over ourselves. That's where Ecumetrics is important because we need to be driven towards uh, digital transformation. And only if we don't lie to ourselves. There is no silver bullet. So to me, it's very promising and reassuring to see that young people as the sustainability topic at the heart of their consideration. But it's also a lesson to say we need to make it operable, meaning that it's affordable for them, uh, looking to the price mention uh, of the other student. I mean, a bit the same. First, great to see that level of concern for sustainability. Huh? Uh, I'm whatever old I am, I won't say it, but nobody was mentioning that when I was uh, at school or university. Huh? So great to see that it's coming. Uh, my message to them would be, this is not as difficult to mix the capacity to do it with the various constraints you can have of lifestyle, cost, etc. So really join us, don't fear AI, and use AI as a wonderful tool, as you were saying, to accelerate and make it affordable to everybody to have a sustainable planet. How can artificial intelligence help companies take up their new challenge? We think that uh, our clients need data and AI to move forward uh, uh, towards sustainability. They don't believe that it's the alpha and omega of, uh, of, of the solution, and we don't believe it neither. So as Nicola was just saying, techno-solutionism is not at all in our DNA. What we think is data must help accelerate and prioritize the right actions to uh, going forward. Okay, so artificial intelligence accelerates sustainable business transformation. How do you articulate these two pillars at Schneider Electric? What I would say probably is, <clears throat> although technology is not the only solution, it can certainly help to contribute to solve the, the climate dilemma. And it has totally shaped our strategy in Schneider and where we think we can help and contribute to solving it is by helping our customers on two topics. And we believe that the one of the things where we can help is through electrification and digitization. Electrification because obviously, even with all the existing today limitations, electricity is the only energy that can be fully decarbonated. Digitization on the other side, because another thing is to use as much as possible decarbonate energy, but also to use as less energy as possible. So by being more efficient, and if you are able to use less energy to heat your buildings, power your data centers, uh, product uh, your cement. If you're able to do that by 10, 15, or 20%, you are actually really impacting 
the climate in a positive way without changing too much the way of life. And digitization is key because if I come back to your question of what we do on our strategy, we have been having in mind since 15 years both sustainability and efficiency, and sustainability through efficiency, helping our customers being more efficient, starting by automating their processes, their building, their data centers, giving them products to do that. After that, to go to the next step, we say, let's connect this product to gather data, understand what's happening in the buildings, in the data centers, in the electrical grid, in the factories, collect this data and provide softwares to help them visualize, contextualize, understand what was happening in their processes, providing also them with platform to store all this data. You see me coming? Obviously, the next step after that to go to the next level of efficiency is to help them with artificial intelligence. And we strongly believe that artificial intelligence is a technique, a tool, where you need also to understand your domain, understand the bias risk, understand the ethical risk, understand the technical risks. Because when you start to apply it on technical, you're going to use it to control machines and you need to make sure of safety, of efficiency, of all of that. And therefore, we believe that by combining AI and domain knowledge in energy management and industrial automation, our contribution to the climate change is to help our customers through digitization to be more efficient and less, much less energy, and if possible, use an electrical one which will be decarbonized. That would be our vision for a world a bit more sustainable for our part, which is a small part of it, but probably a significant part for the customers we serve. To rebounce on what Philippe just said, uh, I'd like to mention Jean-Pascal Tricoir, the CEO of Schneider. He mentioned that to reach our objective of the Accord de Paris to be net zero by 2050, we need to go three times faster and three times bigger right now. So it's all about that. AI must identify where the impact is the bigger and how to get, to get uh, with velocity to this impact. Let me give some examples. Maybe I'll start with examples that are not the, the first thing we think about AI. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, something around soft power of AI. Talking about consumer, to, talking about marketing effectiveness. If I take an example of the automotive industry, which is very regulated, um, I think the, the, the main lever at short term today is to move the product mix towards light electric vehicles not too heavy electric vehicles. And for that, being able to use marketing and data science uh, to understand the consumer behaviors and influence it, that's a, a first key lever. My, my second example is if I take the cosmetic industry, where I would say ethical transparency is key for the consumers. We could use AI, and we can use AI, because we do it already at Techimetrix, to sense the customer perception of the brand, of their products and their services, and then to make sure that, let's say, that the right direction for their products uh, uh, is going the right way. So I think the first power, the soft power of AI, is really interesting to consider. And last example, uh, not soft power, but uh, let's say most, uh, mostly driven by efficiency, on financial services. If you are, if you are a fund or a bank, you have thousands of clients, potentially, thousands of counterparts, and knowing where to act first is really a nightmare. It's too complex. And using AI, once again, you can prioritize that with estimation, statistical estimation of carbon footprints, for instance, and decide where the 80% of your, your, the, 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 the carbon emission, uh, if we take this example, can be tackled with 20% of your value chain, let's say. Um, Nicolas Mier, how would you translate the commitment to sustainability uh, into data companies? Well, I think that the digital transition combined with the ecological transitions are two of the most important trends for the future. We need to square them up. We need to align them. But we need to do that in a way that does not sacrifice, but actually uphold the best from our values in terms of liberté, Egalité, fraternité, and all democratic systems. And that's not easy. Why? Because you know, God knows what can happen under the, the, the shadow of war and the shadow of a, a climate emergency. And God knows what could happen if we resort to these technologies in the way that is not responsible. You know, you have all seen the Black Mirror TV series. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, it's not impossible to imagine in a country not too far away from here, you know, a personal, let's say, uh, climate optimization, CO2 emission powered engine, social scoring, that could really help us move towards net neutrality, but at the cost of privacy and democracy. We do not want that. So we need to square them up and align them in practice. And how do you do that in practice? Well, it's really important that the, the AI community, the AI and data community, starts by exercising responsibility and showing leadership in practice. And a lot is happening in that. A lot is already happening. Maybe a few examples. Uh, we need to, and we are developing responsible AI frameworks applied to the move towards net neutrality in a way that reconciles to biodiversity preservation. Important because there are tensions there. We also need to develop, and we are developing, roadmaps to operationalize critical pathways and solutions towards that to inform the work of governments. Third, we need metrics, benchmarking and evaluation methodologies, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the energy and water footprint of AI. We need to have authoritative and independent metrics to demonstrate what works, what doesn't work, and the impact of, of AI, including negative impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe finally, we need a lot of toolkits including to help in the field of electrification, for example, show pathways towards SMEs and other actors. And one other thing we're doing at the Global Partnership on it, as an example, is we are going to release in the next few weeks a small booklet on AI electricity readiness self-assessment tool to show the way. We will then do it, and we call on others to do it for other sectors, buildings, cities, agriculture. It's important to show the way, but as I said, show the way in the way that is anchored from the get-go uh, into a responsible AI practice. Otherwise, we run the risk of really sacrificing our most important values. Speaking of efficiency, what is your take on AI in the society? But, you know, I was thinking to what these young uh, students were saying. Okay, they want sustainability, but at the same time, they have the constraints of price or availability and so on and so on. And of course, they can try, and I hope they try to solve the dilemma at their level. But we can also try to find ways, and that's really what I believe myself, and I give a couple of examples, if you use AI to optimize the consumption of electricity in buildings. Some people say that building is 40% of the consumption of energy on the planet. If you use AI to forecast when the building will be used, when it's better to start your air conditioning, when it's better to stop your heating, you can, without touching any comfort, decrease by 10 to 20% your, uh, your consumption of, of energy. Another example. People very often uh, make an opposition between economics and sustainability. And I put aside politics. If I look at what we do uh, with our customers, uh, one of the big challenges to, uh, to decarbonize the world, as I was saying, is to use electricity. But electricity itself needs to be decarbonized. So you see more and more solar panels, wind, so you have more and more deconcentrated energy. So you're going to end up with, let's say, a large mall, an airport, a large building, having its own generation of production of electricity, some battery to store some of it, maybe some wind, and connect it to the electrical grid. You need always to choose if you buy your electricity from the grid, if you sell it to the grid, if you store in your battery, if you use what you produce, etc. The first driver will be how can I reduce my cost by using less electricity and, and when the electricity is deregulated to buy it when it is cheap, which means I take from my battery when it's expensive, and I store in my battery and buy from the grid when it's cheap. When it's expensive, it is when you are burning gas and coal and oil to cover the peak. So if with AI, you help all these prosumer, people who have production of electricity, consumption and storage, to optimize their choices, not only they will do a great economical choice, but in addition to that, they will make a great choice of the planet because they will use less, and they will use from the grid when it is green and cheap electricity. So it's not always one against the other. So a combination of behavior, trying to be a bit more frugal, but at the same time, providing things with less energy, more decarbonized, this is where AI can make a drastic change. And, and if I may, um, if I look to the, more, the corporation world more globally than only energy players, I would say that 8% um, only of them are fitting with their own goals that they set themselves towards sustainability, only 8%. And the first reason why there's only 8% is data availability yeah. at scale. I see several reasons for that. The first one is that data is numerous, spread in very uh, tiny systems. Sometimes it's very difficult to collect. That's the first thing. The second thing is that 
the sustainability expertise is very siloed and is very linked to one or two people uh, with head of ESG or head of sustainability. And it has not been spread into all the different business units in the companies. So it's not, a, it's not enough a global question within companies. It's local questions. And we need to, 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 to go beyond that. I would like to add that some companies do things really efficiently with, uh, with AI, breaking those silos and being able to change globally their, their business model. Let me take the example of a sports leader uh, in Europe, Decathlon, that you, that you all know. They, play, they, they have designed a service named We Play Circular, meaning that they, they, they are going from product to service. And behind that, only AI can allow that, meaning when is the, the, the need for a customer to rent an equipment, a sport equipment, versus buying it. And for the next one, we'll use the same equipment. It's all about demand forecasting and understanding where the needs will, will, uh, will occur. So this is AI behind that. And one thing clearly, yeah, data. Uh, data access is a nightmare of any guy working in AI. Yeah? That's the mother of all the battles, no doubt. But, but if I may, why it's so important, as I said before, to develop authoritative and independent metrics, benchmarking and evaluation methodologies is because we need to be able to filter the, what is real, what is sincere, what is actually happening from the ground and on the ground from what is not actually real. I think that, as the students have said, you know, a lot of people are, are fed up with the, the lack of sincerity in delivering those results. And these metrics do not exist yet. For example, on the energy and water consumption and recyclability of our products. They need to be put at the center of our production models to incentivize um, investment, including fiscally, and to put pressure where it belongs. Well, I guess it's time to conclude this second edition of Equivision with uh, Caroline, uh, Equimetrix uh, Global Sustainability Lead. I hope you have uh, enjoyed it and that you have learned as much as we have uh, thanks to our guests. And we see, Caroline, that uh, we are at a very special moment where we can redefine the way we do business. Yeah, it's true, and we can only do it uh, all together as an ecosystem. Uh, in the end, it's not about what AI can do, but what AI should do. Let's have the humility also to recognize that we will all learn a lot along the way. Yeah, that's true. And um, as creators of AI solutions for business, our job, our role is and has always been to create competitive advantages. And, and we are at this moment where we can redirect our modeling, optimization, learning capabilities towards the most important challenges of our clients, meaning redefining their business model. And at Techmetrix, we are really excited to show how strong an enabler and an accelerator AI can be. Yeah, and uh, our mission as data scientists is also to lead the pack towards um, ethical, responsible, and frugal AI. At Eki, we have embarked on a very ambitious and global 2030 sustainable roadmap uh, with a mission statement aligned on both AI for sustainable business performance and sustainable AI. And we are also engaged on the B Corp certification journey. Yes, and I have to say that I'm very proud about the direction we take as a team uh, because it's rooted in that conviction that far from opposing short-term and long-term business performance and sustainability or purpose, differentiation and leadership is coming from the capacity to bridge these both worlds into one single strategy. Yes, and um, it's true that both um, uh, leadership and differentiation are the very roots of strategy. Um, and in order to capture all forces that are interacting with your company under the planetary boundaries, you will need um, to differentiate yourself, to change the way uh, you, op you operate, and to change the way you lead. Thank you, Caroline, and uh, thank you all for your attendance. We are really looking forward for, to sharing more with you in the coming weeks and months.